appreciate Ruth for sharing that with us this morning. Great to be back with you again today. And uh, we've been studying, for those of you who have maybe not been here before, we've been studying through the book of uh, uh, First Peter. Uh, we're about to start chapter 2 today. And I, I mentioned uh, when we started studying First Peter that I think it's a very appropriate book for us to study at this time because... Uh, Peter wrote this book during a time of terrible persecution of Christians. He wrote the book at about uh, 30 years after Christianity had begun. It's about AD 66. Nero was the Caesar in Rome. He'd accidentally set the city of Rome on fire, had to find somebody to blame, and there was a new group in Rome. Uh, they were Christians. Most of them were Jews, and people didn't seem to like the Jews. So he blamed it on, the, on these Christians, and great persecution began uh, against these Christians in Rome and really across the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire stretched all the way from India across the Arabian Peninsula, uh, the Middle East, Europe, all the way out to Portugal, across Europe up to uh, um, Ireland and England. And, and there was tremendous persecution. Uh, when the persecution first began, Peter was actually in Babylon leading a revival winning people to Christ in that new territory. Came back to Jerusalem, tried to the churches he could, found he couldn't contact everybody, so he wrote this book of uh, the books of First and Second Peter, and we're, we've already gone through the, the uh, First Peter. Uh, we're going to look, we're going to begin now on Second and I love this book. And grow as Christians. And it's very practical and it has some very simple ideas that uh, Peter shares that I think are extremely important for us to grasp and to put into practice in our own Christian lives today. Now you remember that when Paul, when Peter began to write, he, he started out in the first chapter here and he was talking about how they need to be careful not to walk away from their new faith. He talked about the inheritance that they had uh, in heaven talked about the fact you're no longer aliens. You're no longer strangers in this world. God's got a plan, a purpose for your life. We're going to talk about the reliability of the Word of God, that God is our Heavenly Father and He loves us. He's got a plan for our life. He's going to exercise that in our life. Um, he talked also about redemption, how we've been bought back from the slave market of sin. And then last week he talked about eternal Christ. Your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life and your future, your eternity, is secure. Well, now he's going to talk about, in these eight verses we're going to look at here in chapter 2, he's going to talk about two major issues. The first major issue that he's going to talk about is the fact that we've been given what I would call a very demanding call. Listen, when you became a Christian, God already had a plan for you before the foundation of this world was laid down. We know that from Ephesians chapter 1. God's got a plan and the Bible speaks of Christians as being the called out ones. We're not like the rest of the world. We've been called out from the world to do the things that would further the purposes of God. And to do that, there are two things that are going to be important. You and I have got to make some decisions that fit in with the call that God has for our life. And not only that, we, we know that God has some very special demands on us that will separate us from a lot of the things that the rest of the world is doing. But that's what we would anticipate, that's what we would expect uh, is going to happen as a Christian. So he begins and he says, now you, you can see right here in the very first part of the first verse, he's talking about you need to be careful, you're going to be effective as a Christian, you're going to have to make sure that you root out sin in your life, that you don't let sin remain in your life or even sneak back into your life. But look what he said at the beginning. Uh, of chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, <coughs> one other thing. Do you notice how he starts with the therefore? Now, let me give you a little secret about what uh, preachers do. Wherever you see a therefore in Scripture, you always want to ask, what is the therefore, therefore? Now, that'll give you a lot of insights. And what he's saying is, now, having told you everything about chapter 1, about your inheritance, your aliens, and the trust with this word, all those things, therefore, he says, this is what I want to tell you. And he goes on and say, listen, you were called out. God has a special calling on your life. Now, one of the things I've come to realize and come to discover, and you know this, 
that none of us are the same and the calling that God has for you is not the same as the calling God has for somebody else. And to me, that's exciting. You don't have to live out somebody else's ministry because God's got a very special plan, a very special ministry for you. And God is excited about your ministry. But it's going to mean you're going to have to make some decisions. You're going to have to fit in with some of these demands that he's talking about. And, and here he begins to say, look what he says, therefore, putting aside, putting aside what? Putting aside some of the old lifestyle you used to have. Putting aside some of the things you used to do. There are some things in your life when you become a Christian, you're going to have to put aside. You can't keep living by worldly standards and worldly principles that you once lived by. You're going to have to put these things aside. You're going to have, like uh, I put here, you're going to have to deal with sin and its root in your life. And he's going to explain to us in just a moment there are two major kind of sins we need to uh, confront. Uh, they're what I'm going to call inside sins and, and outside sins. But anyway, we'll have a look at that in just a moment. So he, he, he talks about this. When you become a Christian, you, you become a new person. You're given a new nature. And I say to people very often that when you become a Christian, your life begins to change quite dramatically, so much so that others, we know this from 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, others ought to look at your life and say, you know, something different about your life. What is it? It gives you and me a great opportunity of telling them about Christ. But that's not going to happen if we don't put aside some of those old things and, and some of the old ways we used to look. Now look, continuing in this verse here, Look at the next part of verse 1. He begins to talk about sin and some of the fruits. Now, he doesn't go to all of the things, but, you know, it's interesting to me. He talks about four things here, what I would call inward sins. And, he, you know, he's speaking to Christians, and he's speaking to Christians that are in churches. I wonder if he's not saying this could be four sins in churches that could really hurt a church if you don't deal with it. I may be wrong about that, but I'm thinking that's what Peter's thinking. But this is what he says. Therefore, putting aside all malice, all guile, all hypocrisy, and all envy. Well, when we talk about malice, what are we talking about when we talk about put aside all malice? You know what malice is? It's enjoying watching others suffer. You know, they don't have the fortunate experiences that maybe you have. And as Christians, one of the great things about Christianity, who was it that started schools? Christians. Because we didn't want people not to be educated. Who was it that started hospitals? It was Christians. Why? Because we didn't want just rich people to be able to get to the doctor. We wanted everybody. You know, and so Peter writes and he says, listen, malice, that shouldn't be part of the Christian or... That's an inward sin that we need to get rid of. We need to get rid of all malice. A desire to see others suffer and when we're not suffering. Then the next thing he said, all guile. You know, guile is deceit that's designed to take an advantage of another. You know, it's a, you know we see somebody else that's hurting us. Well, too bad for them. No, we need to go to help them. That's what Christians do, particularly in the church. No malice, no guile. We're looking for ways in which we can minister and we can help people. And he says, not only all malice and all guile, but all hypocrisy. You know, that's putting on a show, pretending you're somebody that you're not. Let's be real. Let's be transparent. But the people that I love the most, and you do too, I know that you do, are people that are going to tell you the truth. You may not always want to hear it. But they're going to tell you that they're transparent. There's no hypocrisy. Don't need that in the church. And the last one he talks about as envy, and what a killer that is. It's, it's uh, feelings of ill will towards another person, you know, jealous of uh, somebody else. And, you know, it all goes back to this demanding call. Listen, don't worry about what other Christians do. You know, some people can sing. Uh, some people can teach. Uh, some people have, have good skills in hospitality. Now, look, we're all different. We've all got a call. We need to focus on what God has gifted us with and called us to do and do it with a sense of making the decision and understanding the demand. And then he talks about one, only one, outward sin. And he talks about slander. Look at the last part of this verse here. Uh, he says, therefore, putting aside malice and guile and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. You know, slander is... Uh, Finding ways of putting, lifting yourself up by putting somebody else down. 
you know, it's like there's two ways to climb a ladder. You can let somebody get in before you and then you can stand on their shoulders and their fingers if you want to. That's not the way to climb a ladder. If there's two people on a ladder, you let the first person go first and you can follow them up the ladder. But you don't climb on top of them and make it difficult for them. Slander does that. And what Peter is saying here, there's some sins in our life we need to get out. And I think he's speaking about the church here. These things could be prevalent in churches, I think he's saying. So let's be careful to make sure these things are not part of churches because when people come into a church, they need to find people that are called out ones, people who are different. And, you know, the world is looking for difference, it's looking for distinction. They ought to be able to find it in the church. Well, then he goes on with another issue. He says, listen, if you, if you understand your call, then he goes on, he talks about a very decisive conclusion uh, that you need to come to. And he goes on with this in verse 2, and he begins to describe Christian life. He said, now listen, I want you to understand that as a Christian, you start off like a little baby. Now what is it that little babies need when they're little babies? Well, they need care. They need nourishment. If you don't care for them, you don't nourish them, they're going to die. When you Christians, or when folks come into your church and then you Christians, what do we need to provide? The church provides care. It should. It should provide nourishment, the teaching of the Word of God. And this is what he says here. Uh, look very carefully in, in verse 2 as he's beginning to explain and begin to develop, and he talks about the new birth. And he talks about two very important things. He said, when you become a Christian, there's a new status that, that you're given. Look what he said at the beginning of verse 2. He said, like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word. You know, both my wife and I have tremendous privilege of chatting with lots of people and counseling people. We love to do it. Now, you can go to school, you can get a PhD in psychology and all kinds of things, uh, but you know what? I've discovered that the greatest counseling advice that you can give anybody is the word of God. I absolutely promise you that that's true. And he writes here and he says, listen, like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word of God. This week my wife had an opportunity of, of counseling another pastor's wife. It was being challenged and pastor's wives do get challenges. And she constantly said, well, let me refer you to this verse. Let me refer you to this verse. And then she ended up saying, that, you know, the greatest thing you need to do is be sure you stay in the word of God. Listen, no body can give you better advice. No Christian can give you a better advice than that. We need to be in the Word of God. And you know what? The devil will constantly tell you, look, you're doing pretty well. You've been a Christian a long time. You know a lot about the Bible. You don't need to have a quiet time every day. You can handle it without. Don't you believe the lies that are seed of the devil? Peter writes and he said, listen, if you want to grow as a Christian, you're going to have to stay in the Word of God because you've been given a new status. You know, one of the things about parents, and those of us who had kids know about this, you know, one of the things about kids is that they get messy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, they can get really messy. You've got to clean up the mess. And you know, when you clean up the mess, you know what you know? They're going to mess again. <laughs> uh, but you don't throw them away. You don't give up on them. And you know, we're going to have folks in our church going to mess up sometimes. Don't throw them away. Don't give up on them. They're just growing, particularly new Christians. Particularly when we find new folks coming into our church, be sure we care for them. Be sure we do everything we can to, to nourish them with the, with the word of God. Because Peter is saying, look, there's no difference in the, in the Christian life than there is in the human life. And we need to be careful to do that. And then he talks about not only a, a new status, but a new stature. And it's very interesting what he talks about. He said there are two essential things, of course, as, as people begin to grow. And we've got lots of um, grandkids. And we love to go and see them and we love to be around them. Uh, and we love to take photographs. If you want to see any photographs, be perfectly willing to show you some photographs. Uh, but, you know, if I was to take a photograph of one of the children when they were six years of age and they're just laying in a crib in a nappy, and then I show the the picture to them when they're six years old, they're still lying in a crib at a nappy, you'd say, uh, something a little strange about this child, right? Uh, I think you would. 
you see, for a child to grow, they need two things. They need solid food. They can't keep drinking milk. They need solid food, and they need exercise. Listen, you, as a Christian, don't think that it's a good thing just to come to church and sit on a pew. It is good, and you need to be in church. We know that uh, Hebrews tells us very clearly, you need to make a habit of being in church, we're told. But listen, you need to be in the Word, solid Word, and you also uh, need to be exercising. You need to find some way to, to exercise your faith. Be a Sunday school teacher. Um, we've got Vacation Bible School coming up pretty soon. What a great opportunity it is to be a Vacation Bible School. You know, those folks are working Vacation Bible School. One day you're going to arrive in heaven, a kid's going to come up to you and say, you know what? Remember that Vacation Bible School I was at? It changed my life. It's going to happen. It won't if you don't get involved. You need solid food and you need exercise. Look what Paul said about the church in Corinth, the weakest most spiritually derelict church that there was. Look what he says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as men of the world, or the flesh. You're just babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you are not yet able to receive the solid food. And even now, years later, you're not able to for you are nothing but worldly, or fleshly is what he used. For since there are jealousy and strife among you, you are so worldly, and you're not working like anything, like a solid Christian man. You know, there are other Christians that are not really growing. Could it be for what Paul is talking about in the church in Corinth? Now, there he a, a church in Corinth that had enormous ability and a lot of skills but they were more interested in the things of the world than the things of the word of God and we have to make a decision are we going to follow worldly principles or are we going to follow principles that we find in the word of God well then he, took, he goes on and he talks about not only a new birth but look further down here in verse 4 he begins to talk about a secure belief and it's extremely, uh, it's extremely important what you believe. You know the word believe, posture, it's the most used word in the New Testament. In John's Gospel, it's used 92 times in just that one Gospel. I, I think the Bible is trying to tell you something. What you believe is very important. Proverbs 23, 7 said, As a man thinks or believes in his heart, that's the man he's going to be. Because what you believe is what you focus on. What you believe is what you become. That's why it's so important to be in the Word of God. When you fill your mind and your life with the Word of God, you're going to be a walking Word of God. And that's what's going to have the greatest influence on the world in which we live. Well, he talks here about three things, about Christ and his character. He's saying, this is the kind of character that we ought to see uh, in Christians. Look at look what he says in verse 4. Um, he says, and coming to him, that's coming to Christ as a living stone. Now, that's very interesting. In the Greek, that word living is the word zoe, and it means life in all of its fullness. And that word stone there is not the word petros. It's the word petra. Petros is a little pebble, but he's talking about a solid rock that can't be moved. So he's saying, and coming to him, the one who can give you life like nobody else can give you life. That's one of the things that you and I never to need to be afraid of when we're telling people, look, I'm going to tell you what it means to be a Christian because it will change your life and your life will never, ever be the same again. You don't have to be afraid to say that because it's true. It, it, Peter says it right here. Christ is one who is going to give us a Zoe kind of life, life in all of its fullness. It's going to help you to see things in a way you could never see it without the Holy Spirit revealing it to you. You better hear things in a way that only the Holy Spirit can help you to see it. You'll be able to handle things and do things in such a way that only the Holy Spirit, it'll be life and all of its fullness. And he writes here and he says, listen, I want to tell you very carefully um, about this new statue that you have and how we need to to realize that we need to have Christ and that kind of character in our life. And of course, the stone he's talking about here is a chief stone or a cornerstone. Now, I'm not a carpenter, but I, I used to be an electrical engineer and I know about building. And you know when they build a building, they come to one spot and they, you 
you've probably seen them put in some little wood stakes and, and some string and so on. And what they're doing, they're setting the level of the building. If a building's not level, it's going to topple. It's going to fall over. And if your life as a Christian is not kept on the right level, it's going to topple and fall over. And Peter's talking about a cornerstone, a petra, a rock that you can build on that is not going to be easily moved. Then he goes on in the middle of verse 4. Look, at it, he talks about the stone uh, more clearly described. He said, coming to him as a living stone that is rejected by men. It's interesting when he talks here about being rejected. He, he's, you know, he's writing mostly to Jews. And he said, yeah, I, I know how you were when you heard about Jesus Christ. You disapproved of him. And I know why you disapproved of him. Because Jesus said to the scribes and the Pharisees and, and uh, the Sadducees, he said, listen, you're putting more emphasis on the oral teaching of Moses, you know, the things that they said Moses said, than the writing of Moses. Now, you can't go back and attest to the oral things. So that's why they added to it. And they built up all kinds of traditions in the church that were hurting the church. Now, traditions don't always hurt the church, but in this case, they were hurting the church. But the writings of Moses, well, you can go back and check those and they don't change. And, and so Jesus was disapproved of by the forefathers and that's what Peter said. Why do they disapprove of Jesus? Because Jesus is saying you need to trust the written word of God, not what people necessarily say about it or what they add to it. And that's what's so important for you as Christians. Even in church, I say to people all the time, don't just listen to what the preacher says. Go back and read it and study it. And make sure he's telling you the right thing. He's telling you the truth. In most cases, of course, preachers are, but there could be some cases where they're not. But we need to be diligent and we need to study the word. Then he talks about the, the stone display. Look at the last part of verse 4. He says, In coming to him as a living stone rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God. Listen, Peter's saying, Don't you understand the, the plan that God has? Listen, God loves you. It's not God's desire that you go to a lost eternity. It's God's desire that you live a great life, a life in all of its fullness, a Zoe kind of life. But at the end of that, that you go and you live with him for eternity and, and are rewarded by him forever and ever. And so he says, now listen, I want to tell you, this, this life, if you'll commit to it and stay with it, is a precious kind of life. Well, then uh, you'll notice he goes on and he, he begins to develop it a little bit further. He's talked about Christ and his character. Now he's going to talk about Christ and, and how it works out, how, how it works out in the Christian life. And look here at verse 5 when he says that there are three things that are very important that he speaks of in verse 5. He said, you also, you should live as living stones. Now, that is an amazing statement, is it not? Peter writes and he says, yes, Christ is a living son. He's, he's life in all of its fullness. But he used the same word here. He said, but you know what happens? When the Holy Spirit comes to live in your spirit, what, kind of, what does the Holy Spirit develop in your spirit? It develops the character of Christ. And it begins to speak to your mind, to your emotions, and your will. It, it begins to inform your mind control your emotions, direct your will to do what? To be more like Christ. I mean to tell you, the Christian life is one amazing, thrilling, exciting life. And what happens when these things begin to take place, you know what will happen? There are several things that happen. Uh, I'll tell you what they are. You want to hang around with different people. You want to go to different places. You will have a different passion in your life. You'll have a different priority in your life. Just the sheer practice of your life will be different. Why? Because God is developing in you a new nature. And if these things are not happening, maybe we need to check on those sins. We need to be sure we've rooted out these things that are stopping from these things developing in our life. Because, and then he talks about a new location. Look at the, the middle of verse 5. You also are living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. You know, you don't build a house on top of another house. On a, you, know, you, you build it on a new location, right? He said, you know, God's got a plan for your life. The plan he has for you is not like any, any other person. Now, we have three boys. Uh, let me assure you, 
They're not like my wife, and they are not like me. They are very different. Uh, the only thing that's the same is the last name. Sometimes I'll be wanting to take that back too. But they're, they're very, very different. But they're great young men. They really are. They love the Lord. And they all have different ministries because they have different skills and abilities and different insights. And they're all located in their own location, living and serving the Lord. Listen, that's true of you. God is saying to you, my friend, you are a spiritual house. I'm going to put you somewhere where people are going to see something different about you. Listen, we're living in a world of people that are looking for reasons to live. That's why people do crazy things and they get involved in drugs. They're trying to make life exciting. Who has the most exciting life? I believe Christians do. And we're to be spiritual houses. When people see us in whatever location God has put us and we're living in such a way that others can see Christ in us, they are going to ask you something different about you. I mean, there's something different about, well, the, the things that you love. I mean, your language is different. Your lifestyle is different. Uh, your looks are different. I, I mean, you are just different. And when they do that, it's a great opportunity for you and me to say, well, let me tell you what. It's because, you see, I many years ago, I was going down one road and I discovered it was the wrong road. God put me on a narrow road, but it's a great road because this one's going to heaven. That one was going to hell. Great opportunity, but it's, it's a, a new location. And then he talks about, finally, he's talked about a new birth and a secure belief. Now, now he's going to talk about a faithful battle. You know, one of the things I love about the Bible is going to tell you the truth. The Christian life is not easy. I remember one of my boys coming home from school one day, <laughs> and uh, he, 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 I won't tell you what happened, but he had a very unfortunate experience with a school teacher, and she embarrassed him in front of the whole class because he was a Christian, and she knew he was a Christian. He was giving out Christmas cards, actually, and it had Bible verses on it. She told him, you can't do that. He collected all the, Bible, all the Christmas cards from all the kids in the class, and it was terrible. But anyway, he came home, and he said to me, he was crying, he was in his bedroom, and I went in, and I said, Tim, what's the matter, bud? He said, Daddy, I hate that you're a preacher. I wish you weren't a preacher. I wish you were still an engineer like you used to be, but I don't want you to be a preacher anymore. I said to him, Tim, <laughs> I can't do that. Uh, you, because God's given me a different calling. But I will say this. It's not easy to be a Christian too, but it's right. It's right. And that's more important than easy, being right. Listen, it's not easy to be a Christian. And that's what Peter goes on to talk about. He, he, he talks about a battle. And, uh, you know, I, I like to think of the Christian life like a train. You know, if you're on a bicycle, you can go wherever you want to. If you're in a car, you can sort of go wherever you want to. If you're flying a plane, you can kind of wiver. But when you're in a train, you can only go where the tracks are going to take you. The Christian life is like that. It's like a train. You're on the track. And the track is the word of God. And you've got to go where it's going to take you. If you get off the track, you're having an accident. And we don't want to have Christians that have accidents. Well, look what he says. He, he talks about... The, the, the stone, Christ. He talks about the destiny of the stone. Look at verse 6. He says, for this uh, is contained in Scripture. Now, he, he's talking about a prophecy. It's a messianic prophecy from Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. But this, this is what he says. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion in Jerusalem a, a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. And he who believes, that great word, pastuo, he who believes in him, love this verse, he who believes in him shall never be disappointed. Listen, what a wonderful thing you can be assured of as a Christian, talking to other people. The Bible tells us, God tells us, if you will conduct your life to me, no matter what happens around you and things that may happen, I know sometimes it might seem unfortunate, but I want to tell you one thing. You stay with me and you will not be disappointed. Now it's not always easy. Do you, think, do you think God's lying? Do you think he's just trying to impress you? Think he's just trying to get you to be part of the team? No. He's telling you the truth. If you'll stay in the word, stay with him, you're going to find in the end you will win. You will not be disappointed. And Isaiah, he gives this amazing prophecy and he's saying, you know, 
when he's writing this, this is about 722 BC, and the Assyrian army is coming into northern Israel, you know, the ten tribes, and they're wreaking havoc. They're killing people and killing children, burning houses, taking away the animals. And, and Isaiah writes this and he says, this, you're going to be taken away out of captivity because you've turned your back on God. You've ceased to follow his word. You've followed worldly principles instead of uh, worldly pr the principles of God's word. And you know what? You're not going to be changed until the Messiah comes. And of course, it wasn't until Jesus came and died on the cross that, that, that this prophecy actually became real. That's what he's writing about. So he writes to these Christians that are struggling. And he says, listen, we're in a challenge. But remember, it's not easy, but it's right. And then he, he, he talks in verse 7, he, he talks about these stones. Something is foretold about this, these stones. And it brings joy to some. Look at verse 7. He said, this precious value, uh, this precious value then is for you again who believe. He said, listen, if you're one of those who believe, I'll tell you what's going to happen. God's going to bless you. Not just now, but eternally. God is going to bless you. Couldn't there be anything greater than one day when we move on from this world to go to heaven? Is there anything greater than that? Nothing could be greater than that. Is there anything worse than going to a lost eternity? Uh, nothing worse than that. But you know, it's a choice. God presents us. That's why you have to believe. What do you believe? You believe the truth. You believe the facts. People who don't believe the truth and believe the facts, they're heading for trouble. Surely you know that. We know that. I love maths. And one thing I know about maths, it's a fact. So that's one of the reasons I love mathematics. So he says, listen, I want to tell you, it brings joy to some. And it's going to bring great joy to those who believe. Uh, but it's going to bring some judgment to others. Look what he says, he continue in verse 7. Talk about unbelievers and their failure. Look what he said, the last part of verse 7. But for those who disbelieve, who refuse to believe, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. What is a building judged by? How do you build a building? You build it from the corner. If you ignore the cornerstone, and I'll put a bit here and a bit there and a bit, that, that thing will... That, that building will collapse because it won't be level. It won't fit together. Peter says, listen, if you don't get your life attached to the cornerstone, if you don't have a fixed mark that you're building from, whatever you're building is going to collapse eventually. I, you know, one of the things that preachers have a privilege or maybe not a privilege to do is sometimes when people are dying, you're there. I cannot tell you how many times I've held the hands of people who have known Christ and they look up to me and say, Preacher, it's okay. I've got peace. But I can tell you of other times, people grabbing my hand, squeezing my hand to say, Help me, help me. But I can't help them. Because it's the individual's need to believe. And that's what Peter's talking about here. The stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. Because no matter who you are, there's going to be a time of judgment. You're either going to be blessed or you're going to be judged. And what are you going to be judged by? God, our Father in heaven, is going to judge everybody according to the stature of his son, Jesus Christ. And he's going to ask you, and I've said this before, he's only going to ask you one, one question. What did you do with my son? That's all. And for you and me, we got an advocate. Jesus is going to be right there. He said, oh, Father, I know them. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they received me many years ago and trusted me. And the Father's going to say, come on in, good and faithful servant. But what about those who say, well, I meant to, I wanted to, I was going to. The Bible said, oh, you're too late. And then he finishes off with this unbeliever and their future. We, do, we don't like to look at these things. And a lot of people complain about Christians being a cold water committee, but really we're telling the truth. Look at verse 8. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And to this doom they've been appointed. The Bible makes it very clear that God wants to write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's his greatest desire. And when he does, he's got an appointment for you in heaven. But if he looks in the Lamb's Book of Life and your name does not appear, you have no appointment in heaven. 
There's only one other alternative. That's a lost eternity. You know, on August the 12th, 2000, there was a submarine, a nuclear Russian submarine called the Kursk. And it set sail into the Barents Sea. It had gone out into the Barents Sea about 25 miles and all of a sudden there was a terrible explosion. I'm sure you've read about this and heard about this. A huge explosion on that submarine and it began to take on water. There were 118 men on that submarine and they began to, to go from one uh, stage of the submarine to another, close up the doors and lock the doors to try to keep as much oxygen they could in the, in the submarine. Eventually they got to the last compartment, 23 men were in that compartment, and it continued to sink. They sent out a message back to their port and said, there's been an explosion, we're sinking, and all of a sudden, bang, they hit the bottom of the Barents Sea. They said, well, where are you? We don't know where we are. We're out in the Barents Sea, about 25 miles out. Well, how can we find you? How are we going to get you? How are we going to rescue you? Can you get out of that submarine? No, we're too deep. We open up the hatch, we'll never make it to the surface. So they sent out some ships to try to find them. Well, they only had enough oxygen to last without more oxygen being generated for one day, 24 hours. Soon, that 24 hours was almost gone. There was a man on that ship, a sailor on that ship, a young man, 22-year-old, Dmitry Kalashnikov. And as the lights were beginning to dim and he knew the end was coming, he wrote a letter to his wife. And this is what he said. My darling... I've never loved anybody like I loved you. But our submarine is sinking. The auxiliary power has almost failed. And now I'm writing to you in dim light and soon it will be darkness. But I'm writing you to tell you that I love you. But I'm sorry to say soon I will be dead. But my greatest fear is what then? What then? You know, the time for you and me to make that great decision is now. It's not a matter of standing before the throne and saying, oh, what now? No. For you and me, the time is, is now. And God has given us this great opportunity, a wonderful experience of coming to know him and enjoying the most wonderful life that anybody can ever know. And at the end of it, after living this wonderful life and telling others about Jesus, directing them towards heaven as well, what could be a greater privilege in life? When we get to the end of it, greater things to come, even greater things than we faced here in this world. I want to ask you, do you understand that call that God has in your life? You know, it will require some decisions and some demands and you know, if you're going to really be the Christian you should be, you're going to have to eat solid food consistently. You've got to find some way to exercise, some way to serve. But I tell you, if you do, you're going to have a life that will not compare to any other life. And it's a choice. We either choose to live by principles of this world or principles found in the Word of God. And I trust that uh, you are enjoying living by principles in God's word and looking forward to that amazing moment. And who knows when it'll be. And I think Jesus is just around the corner. I honestly do. The amazing moment when we'll hopefully, I hope that I'll live long enough to be snatched right off the face of this earth. But even if I'm not, I know where I'm going. I know it's going to be greater than anything I've ever known before. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for the difference that you make in living. I thank you for this book of First Peter. I thank you for writing to people who are challenged and were facing some very, very difficult times. Some of them lost their life. Some of them were sent to the lion's den. Some were crucified. Some were burned at the stake. Homes and businesses destroyed. Peter writes and says, hey, I know it's a challenge, but I want to tell you this. It's not easy. Never said it would be easy. But I am telling you it's right. And one day, with tremendous joy, you're going to stand before the throne in heaven and be able to say, yes, I trusted your son as my savior. 
and I'll hear those wonderful words. Come on in, good and faithful servant. Father, is any here this morning that are struggling, doubting, unsure? Lord, I pray they'd understand what Peter is saying here. Hey, I've got a great inheritance. I'm not an alien. I'm not wandering around here and not know what I'm doing. I know the word of God. I know that I have a loving heavenly father who's redeemed me from a lost eternity and written my name in the Lamb's book of life. Father, I pray that each one of us today will have that confidence and know that certainty before we leave today. I pray this in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake alone. Amen. Just a moment. Rick's going to lead us in a closing chorus. And as we sing this closing chorus, if God is speaking to you and challenging you today, as I mentioned last week, if there's anything that you want to ask me about or talk to me about, or if you'd like prayer and I can pray with you and talk with you, I'd be more than willing to do that, be delighted to do that. I, I just want you to know for sure that you know the one who loves you, got a great plan for your life. If God is speaking to you and you need to come this morning, come for prayer or for any other decision, I'm going to be here at the front and be delighted to, to share with you and pray with you. Rick's going to lead us as we sing, so if you'll stand together while we sing. Um.